Carl Taylor is one of Australia's brightest young entrepreneurs. Uh, Carl started his first business at the age of 15, but he certainly showed entrepreneurial skills before then. Um, he has written a leading business book called Red Means Go, and it's one of Australia's leading business books. Carl's message is more about just doing it, okay? Not waiting too long till, you, till your ducks are all in a row, just, just having action. Carl's built and sold three businesses, and he has been in the top 30 under 30 year old awards in Australia for the last two years. So if you'd do me the pleasure and the privilege of standing up and putting your hands together for Carl Taylor. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, guys. Wow. Great to see you all. Um, just a quick question, just so I can get a feel for the room. How many of you own your own business? How many of you own your own business? Okay, majority of the room. Awesome. And how many not? How many aren't in your own business yet? Okay, cool. Awesome, thank you. Um, so, as Stephen said, I'm Carl Taylor, and today I'm gonna to talk to you about how you can think bigger and work smarter in your business. Um, Ivan shared with you, you know, how you could potentially get customers from your competitors. How many are interested in getting customers from your competitors? Yeah, so he showed you one way. I'm gonna actually share with you another way. Now, before we get into that, though, um, I firstly wanna thank you guys for being here, because how many of you could be somewhere else right now? Honestly, how many could be somewhere else right now? All of us. I could be somewhere else, you could be somewhere else, all the speakers could be somewhere else. But you guys took one day, two days out of your business, Friday, Saturday. I've been in rooms just like this. I constantly go to rooms just like this. And I know what it takes. So I want to say thank you for being here. And a big thank you also for Stephen for putting on this event. So let's give him a round of applause. And I want to say thank you all for being here, as I said. So just turn to the person next to you, give them a pat on the back and say, oh shit, he's interactive. Okay, so um, I have two rules for our presentation, okay? Two rules. How many rules? Three. Thank you. Three? <laughs> okay. No, two rules. And the first rule is this. What's it say? 100% participation. You might be thinking, well, Carl, I'm already doing this. You might be thinking, oh, do I really have to like raise my hand and call out and do all those stupid, funky things? And next thing you know, I'll have you all standing up and dancing. Don't worry, I'm not going to do that. But there's a reason that you need to participate. Because Stephen talked about you know, there's so much you're going to remember subconsciously, but there's a certain amount you're going to remember consciously. How many of you would like to make sure that this weekend you retain 80% consciously of what you learned? How many would like that? Awesome, thank you. So participating is gonna help you do that. Um, I love learning, I'm obsessed with learning accelerated learning techniques, how can I learn faster, quicker, and implement it? And one of the things is, yeah sure it's a bit crazy, but you know, you can look crazy and weird in here and get results, or you can just sit here and go, no, I'm not gonna do that, and not get the results. It's kind of your choice. By interacting, raising your hand, mo moving your body, you're conscious, you're here, you're going to learn more. So how many of you commit to 100% participation? Awesome. Thank you. Second rule. Second rule. What's it say? Let's try that again. What does it say? Thank you, yeah. Again, you're going, oh, what? Here's the thing. How many of you have ever had your mind in one place and your body in another place? How many of you ever had that experience? Yeah? Driving the car is probably the most common place that that happens. When you do things with energy, you know, if you believe in metaphysical stuff, then there's some reasons around that. But if you don't, when you do things with energy, it brings you into the present moment. It brings you right here and now, mind and body. When you do that, mixed with 100% participation, you are gonna learn so much more, and you're gonna leave this on, and, and Sunday, you're gonna start implementing amazing things in your business, okay? So are we all cool with this? How many commit to 100% participation, maximum energy, say hell yeah? 
Awesome, thank you. Um, so before I kind of get into all the good stuff, um, you know, might be thinking, well, who's this kid? Who's this 27-year-old kid that looks like he's 20? Um, would it be okay if I told you a little bit about me, how I came to be here? Would that be okay? Thank you. Um, Sydney Morning Herald, they called me, what did they call me? They called me a veteran at 26. And when I read that, I thought, oh, that's a bit rich. But you know what? I kind of got over it and went, you know, that's not too bad. You know, I've been in business now for 12 years. And I know some of you have probably been in business longer. Um, I've made plenty of mistakes. I've had some great successes too. Uh, I started my first business at 15. Our uh, first business failed miserably. How many can relate to that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, but it led into my next business, uh, doing web design, web development. I had that all through high school, and I sold that at age 18. I didn't really know what I was doing, and I sold that business for a grand total of $600. Woo! How many of you like $600 to sell your business? <laughs> yeah, I sold it for 10 times less than what it was worth. You know, and you might be going, oh, six grand, that's not that much either, but for a business I ran part-time through high school, I really didn't know what, what I'm trying to tell you guys is I knew nothing about business. I, all I knew is I wanted to get into business because I wanted freedom, flexibility, lifestyle, maybe even wanted people to envy me. How many are willing to admit that maybe that part was your drive to get into business? A couple of people, thank you for your honesty. So I uh, sold that business. Then I bought into an IT support business using absolutely no money. And I had that business for eight years. Ran that business, built it. Uh, changed the business model numerous times, changed the business model once, and lost pretty well 50% of our customers overnight. That was, a, that was a tough one. Very quickly, scrambling, trying to change the business model back to get customers again. Uh, went to sell that business three times, finally sold it in 2011 uh, for a very generous six-figure deal. Uh, then, uh, before I sold that business, I bought a gift hamper business, uh, very different, IT. All of a sudden, I was in gift hampers. I had stock that could go out of date. Who knew that food could go out of date? Crazy, <laughs> crazy. Anyways, I uh, bought that with the whole intention of building it to sell it again. 18 months later, sold it for a 1,000% return. So I, I wrote a business book. I've been in media and different awards. But to be honest, what I'm most proud of is that for my entire adult life, which some might go, well, that's not that long. I'm 27. But my entire adult life, I've had the lifestyle, the freedom, that many dream of and haven't achieved. I've traveled the world because of business. I've given to charities and communities in need because of business. And I've been there for my friends and my family when they needed me most. All because of business. So uh, that's kind of me. One thing I do need to tell you is I am not a financial advisor. I'm not an accountant. All information I'm going to give you is of a general nature. I am a licensed business broker, but I am not those things. So just turn to the person next to you for legal purposes and say, I understand. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so for those, all of you guys who are in business, how many of you started your business from scratch? Started it from scratch. Wow. Vast majority. Awesome. What were some of the challenges? Shout them out. What were some of the biggest challenges when you started your business? Clients, yeah, well, getting those clients, getting those first few customers. Absolutely, what else? Money. Cash flow, yes, finance. Competition, yeah, the comp other people out there competing in the same space. Legal compliance, absolutely, what else? Lawyers, <laughs> lawyers, yes. Anything else? Time, absolutely. Starting a business sucks. It's fun and exciting, yeah, but like, I'll draw, maybe I'll draw it a bit later. I've got this little pyramid, call it the pyramid of awesome. Um, but when we first get into business, right, in that startup phase, it's fun, it's exciting, and we're making maybe a little bit of money, and we're working full time. But what most people don't tell you is once you get past that startup phase, we move into struggle, where we're making a little bit more money maybe, but we're paying staff, so we're not really paying ourselves, and we're actually working overtime. Yeah, and that's what people don't realize. Starting a business sucks. Someone once said, a startup business, I was posted on Facebook a couple of days ago, a startup business is just an organization looking for a scalable business model. So what if you could skip all that startup crap and just scale a business? Would that be pretty cool? Yeah, getting customers. Those first, I, I remember starting businesses where 
In the first six months, so I spent more on registering business names, logo design, websites getting created, business cards, than I made in the first six months of running the business. How many can relate to that? Yeah, everyone goes, oh, starting a business is so cheap, Five, you know, 500 bucks, you can start a business. But they forget the fact that, yeah, 500 bucks, then more money's gonna go out, more money's gonna go out, and there's nothing coming in yet until you get that first few customers. Yeah? So what I want you to do, I just want you to take 60 seconds, turn to the person next to you and tell them a bit about your experience when you first started your business. Go. What were your biggest challenges? Finishing up. And pause, pause. Thank you, partners. I only heard a couple of thank yous there. Come on, guys. Thank you, partners. Awesome. Cool. So here's the thing. Um, I love to learn, as I said before. And for the last 10 years, I have kind of uh, had this obsession of figuring out what separates the average small business owner with the top 2% of entrepreneurs. People like Richard Branson, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates. What's different? I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to be in rooms just like this. Books, seminars, online programs, coaches. I've had business coaches, life coaches. I've been fascinated trying to figure out what is that key thing. And I kind of stumbled across a formula that the top 2% of entrepreneurs use, but most people don't even know it. Would you like to know what that formula is? Was that everyone? Was that maximum energy and 100% participation? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. This is what it is, okay? What's it say? They buy, they build, and they sell. They buy, they build, and they sell. How many of you have ever, or how many of you have a retail business? out of interest, or have ever worked in retail, or ever shopped in retail? How many of you have ever done that? It should be everyone's hand, thank you. Um, what do retailers do? They have a product and they buy it at a what price? Wholesale price, thank you. Wholesale price. Then what do they do? They build some value, thank you, they add value. Now that simply might, let's say you were selling pens, I could uh, add value by going, hey, you're gonna buy two colors instead of one? Or it might be, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Customer, tell me what you need it for. Oh, you need the red pen. And I've added some value, yeah? Which allows the retailer to sell it at what kind of a price? Retail price, a markup, yeah, retail price. Buy it wholesale, add some value, sell it at a retail price. Here's the thing, you are not what you do. I believe as entrepreneurs, my biggest mission is to get you thinking bigger Whatever it is you currently do right now, that is not you. Separate your identity from your business. When I sold my IT business, for those eight years, that was my identity. I had a huge identity crisis when I sold that business. I was like, who am I? That's not right. You are not what you do. You are an entrepreneur, you are in the business of business. How many of you want to make more money? Bullshit. You do not want more money. You want what you believe money can give you better lifestyle, more friends, whatever it is you think money will give you, that's what you really want. So realize as an entrepreneur, you're in the business of business. You are not an accountant, you're not a photographer, you're not a lawyer, you're not a retailer, you're not whatever it is you currently define yourself as, you're an entrepreneur. And you're in the business of business, meaning your product is business. You're ultimately a marketer. When you're in the business, you market what the business does. When you're when you're working on your business, you're marketing that business as a product that you can buy at wholesale, add value to, and sell it at a retail price, okay? Now, I believe that business is about cash flow. Cash flow and helping people. They're the two reasons to be in business as far as I'm concerned. Cash flow and helping people. I used to be one of those guys, big ego, you know, I wanna have billions and billions of dollars. I kind of grew up and went, you know what? That's not right. Cash flow to serve your life. Great book if you've not read it. Uh, Tim Ferriss, 4 Hour Work Week. Talks about TMI, target monthly income. What is your TMI? What is it you need for financial freedom? 
And I guarantee you it's probably a lot lower than you think. And that's all your business needs to provide you. So you can live the lifestyle you want. So this formula, getting back to the formula. How many of you have heard of a little business called Computer Graphics? Anyone heard of a business called Computer Graphics? Yeah, I, oh, one person, awesome. It's very rare. Occasionally I have someone raise their hand. I'm always like, whoa. Um, okay, so Steve Jobs. We've all heard of Steve Jobs, right? Uh, in 1986, he, uh, he bought this little division of another company called Computer Graphics. And he renamed it. And he renamed it and he called it Pixar. How many of you have heard of Pixar? Yeah, now all the hands go out. So he paid $10 million in 1986 to buy this division of Lucasfilms called Computer Graphics. He renamed it Pixar. He then set up a strategic partnership with Disney. Okay? Uh, they created some amazing films like Toy Story and Monsters, Inc., etc. And then uh, Disney had their partnership with McDonald's and it was a great vicious little cycle of strategic alliances. Beautiful. Anyways, 20 years later, 2006, Steve Jobs sold Pixar to his strategic alliance partner. Brilliant move. Anyone who has a guess of, or know what he sold it for? Go higher. Starts with a B, a couple of B, billions. So he sold it 20 years later, bought it for $10 million, a division of someone else's business. He didn't start it from scratch. Bought this business, set up a strategic alliance, built the value, 20 years later, sold it to his strategic alliance partner for $7.4 billion. $7.4 billion. He bought, he built, and he sold. He bought, he built, and he sold. Apple, we've all heard of Apple. Now, Apple was going down the drain. Um, they brought Steve Jobs back in. And bef this is before the iPad iPod and iPad really started to put Apple back on the mark, they needed to change what they were doing. And one of the ways that they did that and they started to get known in the marketplace is that they were a, a, a place for creative types, video editors, music buffs, graphic designers, yeah? Do we all understand that? That was kind of where Apple started to make its comeback. But they never really hit it big until they did the you know, iTunes and iPod, etc. But one of the key things that helped them do that is there were three key pieces of software, because they were really much a hardware business with a little bit of software with their OS X, but it was really some software that put them on the map. Three key pieces of software. How many of you heard of these? GarageBand, iMovie, and Final Cut Pro. How many of you heard of those three pieces of software? Apple did not create those pieces of software. They bought two businesses, which gave them those three pieces of software, which helped them rebuild their business. Okay? Even though they're in an existing business, bought, built, and here's the question, what did Steve Jobs and what did people like Bill Gates do in their business? How do they sell their business? Shareholders. See, one of the biggest things people say to me, Carl, I never want to sell my business. How many of you feel like that? I love what I do, I'm never going to sell my business. Anyone here? A couple of people. Yeah, thank you for your honesty. Um, I used to argue with that um, stupidly. And what I realized is it was not about, what it is, is there's a fear of letting go of the business. You're selling your business doesn't have to be what we call a trade sale where you completely step away, okay? You can sell your business through franchising, you can sell your business through shareholders, even getting private investors is selling your business. This is why I'm not actually a fan of capital raising in the early days. A lot of people, you know, I know a lot of people in the tech startup world, and they're all chasing, it's brand new business, I'm chasing investors, chasing investors. I'm not a fan of that because you know what? You're selling your business at a wholesale price. You haven't built any value in it yet. Most of these tech, tech startups, if they work smarter, you can bootstrap it, you can pre-sell. There's all sorts of smart ways. Capital raising, I think, is the easy way out. That's just my, my view. Um, so you can, you're selling your business no matter what you do. One, one day you will sell your business or you'll shut it down. That's what will happen. Um, getting back to this, Richard Branson. How many of you like Richard Branson, really aspire to be like Richard Branson? Love Richard Branson. He's seen as this big tech, you know, not tech, but startup guru, yeah? He's done this too. Uh, how many of you heard of Virgin Publishing? Anyone heard of Virgin Publishing? So in 1989, Richard Branson bought a company, been around for over 100 years. 
called W.H. Allen. Publishing company, been around for over 100 years. W.H. Allen. Bought it, about a year later, renamed it, called it Virgin Publishing. Then what did he do? You know the formula, what did he do? Yeah, he sold 90% of it, as Branson does. He usually sells about 90% of every business. Two, Random House Publishing. How many heard of Random House Publishing? Yeah, and kept 10% in the Virgin Group to kind of license out his name. Like, Branson realizes that his, what his value is, is his name and the Virgin name. He doesn't fly the planes, right? He doesn't make the music. He doesn't write the books. He knows that he's an entrepreneur. He's in the business of business. He buys, he builds, he sells. Yes, he starts and builds and sells, but he uses buying as well to grow his business, okay? So just turn to the person next to you and say what you've got. Let them know what's the biggest thing going through your head right now based on what we've talked about. Go. Okay, finishing up. Finishing up. And pause, pause. Thanks, guys. Thanks to partners. So, get just a bit of a shout out. I'd love to hear what's some of the takeaways so far. Where are we at? Shout them out. Buy, build, sell. Yes, thank you. What else? Target monthly income. Yeah, TMI. Absolutely. Thank you. What else? Come on, guys. Surely that was there was more to it than that. You were talking for ages. Adding value for premium price. Selling at a retail price. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Separate your identity from your business. Absolutely. Big one. Big one. Keeping an interest in the business that you've sold off, absolutely. Really smart, like equity play. Always look for the equity play if you can in a business, absolutely. We'll get to some strategies on how you can do that. Thank you. What else? Anything else? Come on, give me one more. One more. I'll stand awkwardly like this for the next hour if you like. <laughs> I can. Come on, guys. One more. The business of being in business. Thank you. Appreciate it. Awesome. So, um, I mean, I could go on with a few more examples of this. Ray Kroc, McDonald's. You may not know that McDonald's was started by these two brothers, the McDonald's brothers. However, the man behind McDonald's Corporation as we know it today, Ray Kroc. He was just a salesman. Just a salesman selling milkshake makers and things to restaurants. He got a big order from these two brothers. He thought he'd go check out what they were doing. He was impressed. They'd open a few stores. He liked what they were doing. So he bought a handful of uh, McDonald's restaurants for I think it was 1.2 million back then. He then, what did he do? We all know the story. What is McDonald's really great at? So, yeah, franchising. We're kind of jumping to the cell. Yeah, but the building is systemizing. You know, 14 year olds around the world can make the same crappy hamburger no matter where you are. Yeah, and re real estate. Definitely went for the real estate play. Yeah. But the other key element is he then sold it through franchising. Sold the business again and again and again and again. Franchising, you know, if you want to do it, doesn't suit every business, but it's a great way to sell your business because you get to sell it again and again. The problem is, I don't, I'm not a big fan of buying franchises. So if any of you have bought into a franchise, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, no, it's got its place, but yeah, in general, you're buying at a retail price because someone else has already got it to that point. Or there are some dodgy people out there selling franchises that they haven't even proven the business model works and they're just trying to sell franchises, but I could rant for hours, we don't have time. Um, so how many like to kind of, you might be thinking, well, Carl, but I'm already in business, how does this help me? Um, how many would like to see some numbers on how this could work and apply to your business? How many would like to see that? Okay, cool. So do I need to kind of go through what a profit and loss is? Uh, be honest, like anyone here going, oh, I'm not quite sure how to read a P&L? All right, cool. I'll kind of briefly explain anyway, just in case. So I'm, I'm not going to do all the, the things, but so we're going to look at uh, an existing business. I've just chosen some numbers to make it simple. Um, if you, I don't know what sizes you're at. If you need to add zeros, remove zeros, go ahead. Cool? To make this relevant to you. So we've got our revenues. Okay, so we're doing 250 grand in revenues. Our cost of goods are 100,000, meaning we have gross profits of 150 grand. You're all with me so far, yeah? Cool. Let's say we've got 120 grand 
in expenses, meaning we've got 30 grand net profit. This is our net profit. Yeah? If we were to sell our business right now, are there any accountants in the room? Awesome, cool. So, um, right now, did anyone get really involved in the you know, sale of business and valuations in particular? Cool, right now in Australia, what's the average for like an average small business, one that's kind of, you're buying it from the owner, it's, you're buying yourself a job, what's the multiple that most people are selling for? What was that, one? Yeah, one to one. Yeah, look, you know, it's one to a two times. But yeah, thank you, yeah. So, if you were to sell your business, there's so many different valuation methods. The accountants in the room will be able to tell you heaps. As a business broker, they taught us like 50 stupid different valuations. The most utilized one around the world is known as a multiple of EBIT, earnings before interest and tax, or sometimes EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. Basically, it's really a fancy way, there's a bit more to it, but it's a fancy way of talking about your net profit. Cool? So congratulations, you're all basically licensed business brokers now. Um, so right now, if it was a one-to-one, -one, that would mean that this business, 30 grand of profit, is worth how much? 30,000, one times the net profit. It's a one to a two times multiple. Um, so in this example, let's be generous, because a, a lot of people are going for a one times because they haven't set up their business properly. Let's, for this example, say we could sell our business for one and a half times. We'll kind of split the difference, okay? So one and a half times, which would make that business worth what? 45,000. 45,000. Okay. Yeah. So what we're going to do, because I wanted to show you how this is relevant to you already in business. This is our business. We're going to now go and buy a competitor. We're going to buy another business that does exactly what we do. And guess what, to make the math simple, they've got the exact same numbers as us. They're doing 100, 250 grand in turnover, 100 grand in cost of goods, uh, so gross profit, expenses are the same, so we've got the same net profit, cool? So what's gonna happen to our turnover? What happens? We go to 500. What's gonna happen to our cost of goods? Does it go up to 200? Who said it shouldn't? Thank you, why not? Bulk buying, economies of scale. I think the number one skill that every entrepreneur should have is negotiation. And it is a skill, it's not a talent you're born with. Trust me, I sold my first business 600 bucks. I couldn't negotiate at all. Um, I can now. Now, the best skill you can ever have in is negotiation. In business, you're negotiating with customers, suppliers, friends, real estate, landlords, family. You know, sorry honey, I'm working tonight. You know, that's a negotiation. It really is. So, we could make some savings. If we're still, it's a competitor, we can go back to our supplier and go, you know what? We're now selling an extra 250 grand worth of stuff. We're buying another 250 grand worth of stuff. Surely you can, you know, let's say we're selling pens for like a dollar and we're buying them for 50 cents each. Well, come on, you can give them to us for 40 cents or 45 cents, surely. All right, and we go back and negotiate. So, let's not go crazy. Let's say we can save oh, 15 grand. Over a 12 month period, does that seem fair? Yeah, cool. So that would mean we'd go to 185 grand cost of goods, which means our gross profit is now $315,000. Yeah. What's gonna happen to our expenses? If we're already in business and we buy another business, are we gonna add 120 plus 120? Why not? Yeah, incorporate some expenses from one business to the other. See, if you have a receptionist and the business you buy has a receptionist, do you need two receptionists? No. If you have an office, they have an office, and there's no reason to keep two offices, do you need two offices? Could you consolidate into one or go and get a new office that's cheaper? Well, that's where you wouldn't make that saving if you were going to do it. So the question for the recording was if you were buying another uh, business that you wanted to keep separate as a competitor and not know and not amalgamate them, then yeah, you couldn't make a saving on that, but there'd be other savings. See, things like accounting. They have an accountant, you have an accountant. Are your accounting fees going to go up? Yes. Are they going to go up as much as what they're currently paying on top of what you're paying? No. 
your fees will go up. Same with bookkeeping. Fees will go up, but they're not going to go up as much as what they're currently paying. Mobile phones, phone systems, you can get it all combined. Websites, hosting, join, you know, share a server. There's all sorts of... This here is like one of the most powerful lines in this. See, Albert Einstein was once asked, what did he think was the greatest invention um, by man? Does anyone know the answer? Compound interest. Thank you, compound interest. This is compound interest for business. And the biggest one happens here in this line. Better, like, so I teach people how to buy a business from scratch, but this is actually even more relevant and more powerful to you already in business. Because you get faster results. Because you've already got a whole bunch of expenses that you can save on. So let's say we can save, let's say we was one employee. Yeah, they were getting 40 grand a year and we don't need them anymore. So we can go now to 200 grand expenses. We've saved 40 grand, okay? Maybe we bought some systems that helped to save that person, another double up of employees. So what's happened to our net profit? Yeah, to what? 115, thank you. Here's the thing, you know, I know it's early and we're doing math. Don't worry, I suck at math. I did general math, I use calculators all the time. You don't need to be a math whiz to succeed in business. You just need to know what the numbers mean as long as you understand what the numbers mean and can use a calculator, you're fine, okay? So is it okay if we go continue going through a little bit more math and then we'll get a bit more uh, fun? If I could show you how you could double your business pretty well like that, would that be okay? All right, just check it, just one check. So if we were gonna still say we could sell this business at a one and a half times, what did we sell this business for? If it was one and a half times? Any math whiz? It's 172 and a half. Okay, so if to buy this business, we figured out we were worth 45 grand, yeah? So when we bought this business, we would have paid 45 grand for that business. So we had 30 grand in profit. We spent 45 grand. How much to our profit did we add? Did we get our money back in one year? And we're not even talking some creative finance, which I'm gonna get to on how you can do that without actually having to pay 45 grand up front. Would that be cool? <laughs> And then look at our value if we actually sold the business. Or, this is the other thing, if you don't sell your business, the value of your business is important because of a little thing called net worth. You know, you hear about the BRW, rich list, right? And they're worth billion dollars. Mark Zuckerberg, billionaire, right? He doesn't have just a billion dollars sitting in a bank account somewhere. That's not how it works. His net worth is that. His shares in his company is worth that. His assets. Does that make sense? So your ability to get loans and all sorts of things come into the net worth of your business. So not only did you get the profits, which could be money in your pocket, but also the value of your business, making your net worth increase as well. And accountants can show you whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, and that's your thing to figure out, but this is the power. What if you knew, if you know what you're doing, it's not that hard to go from a one times to a two times. Well, there's kind of two ladders to build a business, right? I call, one is the profit ladder. You need to increase profits. This is one strategy. This is actually one of the high level strategies of the profit ladder. The second thing is the value ladder. And the first two rungs of the value ladder are systems and security, okay? And those two things can very much easily take you. And you guys are in this room, you're learning systems, I know that. That's gonna help you go from a one to a two times, okay? So if we sold this business for a two times, what would we sell the business for? It'd be 230 grand. We could sell our business just by spending 45 grand. Instead of selling our business for 45 grand, we spend another 45 grand in 12 months of our life and we've now been able to sell our business for what, what percentage is that? I don't know. It's a lot, right? Now I'm seeing some like faces where you're like, five times, 500% return, nice. Is this stuff good? Is this getting you thinking bigger? Maybe working a little smarter? Hell yeah, nice. Um, so look, just quickly, uh, turn to the person next to you and tell them what's the best you got so far. We're going to move on. We're going to show you how you could actually buy another business, and this will be an interesting one. Um, but just share with the table right now. What's the best thing you've got? How could this apply to your situation? Go. Awesome. Awesome, thanks guys. So shout it out to me, what are some of the things? How, who, who feels like this is something you could actually implement in your business right now? 
Okay, a couple of people. Awesome. How do you think that over the next two, three years, this is something you could be looking at in your business and entrepreneurial career? Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So um, now I'm going to show you. This is pretty cool, right? But we're not done. Because, as I said, we're going to get in a moment, I'm going to show you how you, you know, because you might be going, well, this looks all good, Carl, but those of you who didn't raise your hand, is it because you're like, well, I don't just have 45 grand sitting around to go and buy another business? Is that for a couple of you, why you didn't raise your hand? A couple of people, yeah, Hell thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. So I'm going to show you why you don't need to do that. I mean, I've had students who've been able to buy businesses uh, for 20 grand that are doing million dollar turnovers. Um, businesses for as little as one dollar. Not one dollar now and not a dollar in bitter, but one dollar. We'll get to that, okay? We'll get to that. But we aren't finished because what if we decide to buy another business now? So we've done this, but we choose... And remember, we haven't actually done anything organic growth here. The slow, what I call slow growth, marketing. Because we've now got a whole bunch more customers. Could there be other things we could be on selling, new services, products, etc.? So this could actually go up. We're just talking about a pure acquisition. What we're going to do now is we're going to buy another business. And let me show you the... I'll do it over here. Actually, no, I'll, do it, I'll do it here. Okay, we're going to do a, buy another business. And this business is doing 100 grand in turnover, 60 grand cost of goods, meaning it has 40,000 in gross profits, and it has 60 grand in expenses, which means its net profit is what? Negative 20. What do you think you would pay to buy that business? A dollar, yeah, maybe, maybe. If you know what you're doing and you know how to frame it right, quite possibly. However, we're not gonna pay one dollar for it. We're gonna pay 30,000, no, sorry, 20,000. We'll pay 20,000 for it. Even though it's losing 20 grand a year, we're gonna pay 20,000 to buy this business. Maybe they had a truck, let's say we were like a plumber or something, they had a truck and we felt it was worth 10, 15 grand, so that's what we paid, yeah? So, we're gonna pay 20 grand for this business. What's gonna happen to our business now? Let me use the wrong color. So we go 500 plus 100, what's that? Yeah, exactly, getting the guy out of trouble by giving him 20 grand, um, and you know, here's some money for your asset, see you later, I'll take over your business, yeah? So, we got 600 grand now for our turnover. What's going to happen to our cost of goods? They could go down, absolutely. They highly likely would. But you know what? For this example, just to make it even more bit wor worst case scenario, let's actually leave it exactly the same. Yeah, we cool with that? Because like I said, I want to try and make this as realistic and show you kind of what's and all how this can work and why this is still a good thing. Okay? So that stays 60. Uh, so we're going to add 60 to 185, which I've already done the math to save me the time. It's 245. 245 grand. Okay? 245 grand. So our gross profit now is 355. Okay? What's going to happen to our expenses though? They're going to reduce. This is where the biggest saving happens. If we're buying a business like this that's been losing money here, chances are the big problem, this 60 grand, is probably uh, partly made up of some of the wages he was taking for himself, um, other stupid expenses that were sending him down the drain. And so a lot of this we're already doing, if not all of it, possibly. All we may actually have been taking is where we took that asset and we're taking his customers and his suppliers, possibly. So we could actually wipe out that whole 60, but we're not going to wipe out the whole 60. Let's wipe out 40. We can save 40 grand. Remember, we're talking over a 12-month period here as well, an extra 12 months. So that means we're going to go up to $220,000 in expenses. What's happened to our net profit? What's our net profit now? 135. Thank you. 135. So we were doing 115 grand in net profit, yeah? We spent how much? 20 grand. How much did it add to our net profits? 20 grand, so we got our money back in the first year. Another year after that, another year after that. Plus we got a whole access to a whole bunch of new customers that we could be on selling as smart entrepreneurs, we're on selling other things, products, services, yeah? But we're not talking about that right now. 
What's going to have happened to our value? We already said we could probably sell this for a two times. So let's sell this for a two times. Which means we can sell this business for what? Was it 270? Thank you. 270 grand. So we were worth 230. We spent 20 grand. And we were able to sell our business already for more than that 20 grand on top. Yeah? And as I said, we haven't done any organic growth or anything like that. Does anyone know what that is, the percentage return on our original? So right here, back here, okay, we're in a business, we're doing 30 grand net profit. And for some of you, maybe that's you. As I said, add a zero, remove a zero, whatever works for you. We spent 45 grand. We then spent another 20 grand. So how much in total have we spent? 65 grand. I'm going to show you how you don't actually have to spend 65 grand right away to do that. But 65 grand, what did we do to the value of our business? Sixfold. We spent 65 grand. When did we get our 65 grand almost in that first acquisition? In 12 months? And remember, this is ongoing profitability. Plus, we probably got some staff to do more of the work that we're doing, maybe got some systems, because business is about lifestyle, yeah? You don't want to be doing everything. So you get customers. All those things we're talking about, starting business, why it sucks. You buy customers, you buy suppliers, you buy, if someone's taken 10 years to build their business and you buy it, you are buying 10 years worth of blood, sweat, tears, uh, stress, frustration, marketing, figuring out what worked, what didn't work, that startup trying to find the business model that's scalable, and then you get it, and guess what? You don't pay for it. If someone spent a million dollars to build their business over 10 years, as much as they'll try and tell you it's worth a million dollars, it is not worth a million dollars. Not just because that's what they spent. Okay? This is compound interest for business. Now, as I said, you're probably all going, well, that's all well and good, Carl. Sounds maybe too high level for me. It's not accessible. You can do this now. You can do this now. There are two ways to finance buying a business. How many ways? Two ways. The first way... This pen sucks. What does it say? The usual way. What do you think are some of the usual ways? Yeah, so we've got, say, our savings, yeah? Money we've got squirreled away for a rainy day. We've got banks and finance institutions. What else? Yeah, friends. It's what's known in the industry as the triple F fund. Friends, family, and fools. Okay? I've borrowed money from family. I don't recommend it. I've never done the whole friends thing. I can imagine it's probably 10 times worse than family. Um, and fools, when we're talking fools, we're not talking about fooling people. We're talking about people with a high risk appetite. You know, sometimes known as angel investors. Okay? So we've got the triple F fund as well, angel investors. They're kind of the usual ways to finance buying a business. Credit cards, bank loans, personal loans, whatever, triple F fund, or our own savings. However, as entrepreneurs, we are creative, yeah? How many would agree that we're creative? Okay, awesome, thank you. So let's be creative in how we finance buying a business. How many of you have heard of um, some creative finance? Anyone got some ideas? Shout them out. Vendor finance, yep. Vendor finance, absolutely, thank you. Uh, how many, who, who can tell me what vendor finance is for those in the room who don't know? Who can explain what it is? What was that, sorry? The owner wants to leave equity in the business? Yeah, kind of, thank you. What, anyone else? Time payment, yeah. It's, it's really basically where the person, in, in the US and Europe, it's known as seller financing, not vendor financing. Vendor financing is equipment in, in their terms. Um, but it's where the person selling the business gives you the loan to buy the business. So let's say I'm selling a business for $100,000. And you come to me and you go, Carl, I love your business. I think it's worth 100 grand. I think it's great. Here's the problem. I don't have 100,000. I've got 10,000. If I give you $10,000 now and I pay you $10,000 a month for the next 10 months, 
So you get a total of 110,000, would that be okay? If I said yes, the business sale agreement would be $110,000. You would give me $10,000 now, and then we would have a personal loan saying you owe me $100,000. And you're able to pay that off out of the finance of the business, the cash flow of the business. Now, you might be thinking, well, how realistic, how often does this happen? There are some business brokers out there that will tell you that vendor finance doesn't exist. I remember once I called up to buy a business. Vend uh, the broker said to me, he's like, oh, vendor finance, you've been to some of those seminars or something, right? I was like, well, actually, I run those seminars. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he's an he, he was an idiot. If anyone ever tells you that doesn't exist, they're not very good at their job. Uh, this happens in the big end of town and small end of town every day. There are a lot of businesses that will not sell unless there's a component of vendor finance in some way, shape, or form. Little sneaky thing if you're looking to sell your business. One of the best ways you can get a higher price for your business is to offer vendor finance. But the big trick when you're asking for vendor finance is you don't actually ask for vendor finance because the answer is pretty well always no. Okay, so there's, there's a few little tricks there. But uh, if you want to know, if you're thinking, oh, I don't know if I could do this. Um, I don't have a slide actually of her. One of my students, her name is Imogen. She's eight years old. Eight years old. She has a dream, she wants to own a cafe. As an eight-year-old, she doesn't really have any money, yeah? To do my course, we had this big uh, uh, negotiation. Uh, we went to KFC, had a di dinner over KFC to negotiate, and she, she had some silver and some little different things that she had um, been saving, and because her parents are very, you know, personal development things had been encouraging her early. So we sat in this negotiation, and she's negotiated to give me all these assets that she had, and I'm holding that in trust, um, to do the program. And, uh, you know, when she successfully sells a business, she's going to give me three times the price of the course, and if she doesn't, I get to keep all her assets. Um, we had negotiated hard. She managed to get her, her dad to, to chuck in a couple hundred bucks as well to uh, be held in assets. But anyways, it was really great. But the thing is, she doesn't have any money. Her parents have said they're not going to put any money in to buy the business. They're happy to drive her around to negotiations and things, but that's it. She's had three cafes agree to vendor finance. Three cafes, one asking $150,000, have agreed to 100% vendor finance. That's pretty rare, but it happens. 100% vendor finance. So if she can do it, you can do it too. Another one of my students, he sent me a text message, he's saying he had three deals. See, I often use examples of cafes and um, beauty salons, hairdressers. That's because a lot of people in my community, that's what they're looking for. But um, this works in any industry. Hotels, um, a, a guttering business. Uh, so what, yeah, one of my students, he, what did he have? He had, he had two motels agree to vendor finance. He had a dog grooming business agree to vendor finance. Uh, he had a guttering business agree to vendor finance. He had a roofing business, um, plumbers. You know, sky's the limit. So vendor finance, great strategy. It's probably my second favorite strategy. Any, any others? Any, know anyone, any others? Solicitor finance. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, so that, I mean, that's a bit of a twist on vendor finance, but yeah, absolutely, thank you. Yeah, so we can call that one, we'll call it solicitor finance. Awesome. Any others? Venture capitalists? Yeah, that can maybe come into the fools here, but yeah, definitely. Um, you know, was there one up there, Ivan? Taking an option? Yeah, an option on the business? Absolutely. So an option is kind of like where you put some money down to say, I'm going to buy this business over time, right? I want the option to be able to buy the business at this price, at this time. Yeah, people do this in property all the time. My favorite strategy is what we call what's it say? Knowledge and skill. How many of you have ever, and Ivan kind of touched on it a couple of times this morning, how many of you have ever been to a business, been to a website, been to a cafe, and gone, you know, if they did this, they did this, they did this, they could be doing so much better in the business? How many have ever done that? I do it all the time. If you do that too, then it shows me you have some knowledge and some skill that would be of value to that business. 
And that knowledge and skill can be traded for equity in a business. You can actually get ownership in that business because you have some complementary knowledge or skill. Now, how do I know this? Because I've done it. My IT business that I had for eight years after I sold my web design business, I was given 50% of that IT support business. It had been around for two years before I got involved. I was given 50% of that business and a full-time salary for eight years, all because I had some knowledge and some skill. The, the challenge is a lot of techie people, and I'm allowed to say this because I was in the industry uh, for so many years, a lot of techie people are really great at what they do, but they suck at one thing. Can anyone tell me what that thing is that they suck at? Business and explaining, selling themselves, thank you, explaining what the hell they do in plain English so that people know exactly what they're talking about. I was a very shy, introverted kid. You wouldn't know that uh, looking at me today, but I was a very shy, introverted kid. Um, I didn't like speaking to people. I got into business behind a computer, a web business, because I thought, great, I can sit there all day and not talk to anyone. Um, but I seem to have, uh, while I can talk geek speak, I seem to also have this ability to simplify things and explain it in a way that people go, oh, I get it. That was an, a skill. I really self-taught myself a lot of software. The guy who had this business was really good at hardware, but he's an older guy. Not really sure you know, where he's going to take the business. He was only really serving home users and things. I was able to negotiate to buy into this business, got 50% of the business, full-time salary, because I had the ability to sell and explain things, but also I was prepared to learn servers, small business server, this kind of thing, which allowed us to start targeting bigger businesses. And we were able to change the business model. And because I was so wrapped in learning, I was reading business books all the time, I was prepared to do the marketing, and he just kind of did the back-end office stuff. It was a great partnership. Sold that business in 2011. I got 50% of the sale price plus the salary all that time. Uh, another student of mine, Paul, he came to me, struggling uni student. Okay, he was 20, he's 22, maybe he's 23. Anyways, he came to one of my seminars, uh, made the offer to join the program. He came up to me, he goes, look, I really wanna do this. Like, I see myself as a career entrepreneur buying, selling businesses. Like, I've always thought of business as my career. I just didn't have a word for it until you showed me. I was like, great. It's like, here's the problem. I don't have any money. I'm a uni student. I've got no money. What do I do? I was like, look, I'm not going to sell you on this program. It's your call. You've got to decide how much you want this because I've been in your position not having money and going, how am I going to afford it? I found a way. If you want it, hit me up in the next few days. I'll honor the, the deal. He called me up two days later. He's like, I'm ready. So he came on. He managed to find the money. I think he borrowed some money from family. Challenge was, he pretty well spent all his money to do my course, right? How's he going to buy a business? So we looked at a few things. Uh, he looked at, he was looking at multi-million dollar businesses to buy. He had the confidence to do that after doing the program. But even though he knew he had no money, he looked at vendor finance. Great. But ultimately, he's a great salesman. He's prepared to do what a lot of entrepreneurs aren't, which is hit the phones, do, set up strategic alliances, go to meetings. Great skill. He found a guy who was a techie guy who great at doing websites, but again, sucks at explaining what he does, sucks at selling. He now owns 50% in this mobile marketing business, 50% of the business, didn't cost him a cent because he had knowledge and skill. And in his first week in that business, he set up a strategic alliance set to bring $100,000 into that business. Was that a good deal for both the seller and the buyer? Yeah, because he had knowledge and skill. This is what I'm saying, every single one of you can start doing this today. Not, oh, I'll do that in 10 years' time. This is accessible. You can spend the next 10 years figuring stuff out, or you can just go, this is where I want to be, and let's just do it. I'm a Gen Y, and people call us lazy. I call it strategic. Okay? I will work hard, but I will not work any harder than I actually have to to get the result I want. How many of you would think that that's a pretty fair thing? So same with my students. I tell them in the program, I said, if you are looking for, I'll click a button, I'll be making online. If you're the kind of person who buys into those programs, I don't want you. You're going to have to work. But I promise you, you won't have to work any harder than you have to to get the result you want. And this is part of the way you do it. Save yourself, taking quantum leaps, skipping steps. Um, so yeah, knowledge and skill, vendor finance, uh, what are some other options? Um, oh, the $1. Let's talk about $1. I used to run a seminar called How to Buy a Business for a Dollar. I stopped running that because I was finding I was getting a lot of people coming to me going, I've only got a dollar in my pocket. And it's like, well, you know, it's doable, but 
you know, it's not the only thing. I'm about buying at a wholesale price, right? But one dollar, how did it come about? A lot of people, when they hear that, and you might be the same, have gone, well, you must be ripping people off. To tell someone their business is worth a dollar, that's outrageous. Be honest, how many of you think that that might be a bit outrageous? Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. They think, oh, Carl, you must be ripping people off. I can't believe I'm going to report you. You know, I am, that if people who know me, that is furthest from the truth. It's about win-win relationships. It's about finding someone in need and help. Remember, business is about cash flow and helping people. Buying businesses is one of the best ways you can help people because a lot of people selling their business are in need. They either need to retire, health reasons, all sorts of things. So let me frame, actually, before I explain how it all came about, I actually want you to, we have a bit of a competition in the room. I'm going to give you five minutes, five minutes. At your tables, I want you guys on a list to come up with as many reasons as possible that someone would sell their business for one dollar. Now, the, the way this works, okay, let me explain the dollar before I tell you my story and stuff and you do this. I'm not saying their business is worth a dollar. I'm actually saying their business is worthless to me. Worthless to me. I'm not saying it's worthless. I'm saying it's worthless to me. So, the one dollar is to allow a transaction to occur for us to transfer assets legally. That's all it is. This happened on the big end of town. I'll give you some examples if we've got time as well. But I want you guys, this is your chance. Competition. See who can come up with the most reasons that someone would sell their business to you for one dollar. Okay? Your time starts now. You've got five minutes. Go. And pause. Awesome. So, who thinks that you won? Who thinks you got the most on your, on your table? Got the most list? Wow, not much confidence in this room, is there? Wow. Call yourselves entrepreneurs. Um, okay. So, sh who got more than five? Who has more than five? Okay, cool. Who has more than eight? Who has more than ten? Who has more than 12? Who has more than 15? You guys? Uh, okay, back of the room there. Can we get the mic to them? Read out, let us know. What did you have? All right. Going to do well to sell some of these, I think. But uh, we'll see how we go. <laughs> uh, they're insolvent. They're yep. carrying a debt, illness, family yep. reasons. They're yep. fed up. Uh, tax avoidance. Yep. Uh, another opportunity has presented itself and they need to get out. Shiny balls, yep. Uh, there's changes in the industry, things have moved on, they don't understand it and that sort of thing. They're yep. relocating, family disputes, Yes. Uh, protection of assets, so if they're selling it to someone that they know for some reasons, husband, wife sort of thing. Yep. Uh, there's a lease and they just want to get out of it, but Absolutely. they have to uh, have the lease. Um, and then there's an economic deter downturn, they've lost hope. Uh, and then we've got piggybacking. piggybacking someone else's success. They might want to just get in on someone else going well um, and selling shares, so buying shares for a dollar. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Give them a hand. <laughs> Does anyone think they had any that was missed? Yeah, cool. Um, just let us know, the ones are missed. Wants to have a job. Mm. Yeah. So willing to swap uh, the business, get out of the business because he sucks at doing the business stuff. Likes what he does, just wants to kind of stay employed, but doesn't want to have the headaches of business. Absolutely, big reason for sure. Thank you. Give him a hand. Yeah, up the back there. Yeah, absolutely. Divorce, relationship split. Huge reason that this kind of thing will happen. Absolutely. Thank you. Give him a hand. Yeah. Loss of a license. Another one would be um, uh, if they've lost or been defeated some sort of compliance. So yeah, some sort of compliance like issue. Comp thing where they get workers round box and pay workers comp. Absolutely. Thank you. Give them a hand. Awesome. Well done. So how many of you starting to go, you know, maybe this is actually achievable? How, how many of you are now going, wow, I could maybe buy a business for a dollar? This does happen. Only a few people's hands go up. Really? Seriously. Like, how many are you going, wow, this is a bit more realistic than I thought? Awesome, thank you. Okay, so um, let me quickly, I know time's coming to an end, so let me quickly tell you about how this came about for me. Uh, there was a cafe asking $30,000, and I um, went and saw this lady, and as I always do, I was like, well, tell me about your situation, what's going on? And she told me that she ran a very successful business already, full-time. This business was her husband's business, the cafe, 
and she, you know, he'd left her. She didn't know where he was. Her son, who just finished high school, she thought maybe he'd want to run the business. He's not interested. She had eight months left on a lease and she had staff. She was like, look, I'm just probably going to shut the business down because I, I just can't do anything with it. And I said to her, I said, look, you've probably got about 20 grand worth of assets here. You've got deep fryers, fridges, etc. I'd have to get my valuer in to come and value it all. And you know what? I'm just, to me, it's, I'm just not that interested. The best I'd be prepared to offer you, if you don't get a better deal, is I'll take over your lease and I'll keep your staff. And she said, word for word, I could be open to that. And she actually chased me for three weeks going, hey, you know, because I was like, look, I don't want to be up at 5 a.m. making coffees. Um, I want someone who's going to be managing the staff. Is there anyone in the staff that could step up? No. So she was finding people, bringing them to me, saying, hey, this person might be able to manage the store. This person might be able to manage the store. That's how the $1 deal came about. This is also one of my students. He recently he's bought two hair salons. He used to be in a franchise business. He was working really hard. I won't tell you what the franchise was, but he basically was working really, really hard. He got into business so he could spend more time with his family. The challenge was he's swapping time for money, and every time he got a new client, which he needed to make more money, he was spending less time with his family. He had uh, two young kids. And uh, so he was kind of stuck. He's just working way too hard, making OK money, but working too hard in his franchise and feeling restricted because he learned a lot about marketing and he couldn't do it because the franchisor wouldn't let him. So he sold out of that. Didn't do all that well selling out of it, to be honest, because, well, that's what it's like selling franchises, unfortunately. Um, He's now bought two hair salons. So he was a handyman. He knows nothing about cutting hair. He's now bought two hair salons. The first hair salon was asking 120 grand. He bought it for $20,000. $20,000. They were asking 120 grand originally. He then, week after set, getting that deal locked in, he went and found another hair salon. He's very eager. He's already looking at another two, and I'm like, just hold your horse, let's get the first two working well. Um, he bought another one, they were asking 60 grand. He's bought it for one dollar. And the person was like what you were talking about here, the person has stayed employed. They just hated the business stuff and they want to keep cutting hair. On his first day in the business that he bought for a dollar, he calls me up and he goes, Carl, I thought that within six months I'd be able to kind of walk away from this business and make money without having to be here. He's like, this is my first day. I've made $900 for me and I didn't do a single thing. I could walk out of this business tomorrow and just do a little bit of marketing here and there. He's like, this is amazing. So he spent $20,001. He now has two hair salons. He's rebranding them to be the same, and he's planning on acquiring a number of them, and then ultimately he'll sell it as a group in probably a couple of years. He now has more free time and more energy, and he's working on the business. He's being a proper entrepreneur. You've probably heard it, work on the business, not in it. He was able to do it because he bought a business that already had staff doing the... He doesn't know the first thing about cutting hair. He doesn't need to. Okay? So absolutely, this is doable. Doable. Uh, and this happens in the big end of town. Luna Park in Sydney was sold for $1. ABC Learning Centres. You know how many remember ABC Learning Centres? Uh, Mission Australia, a uh, not-for-profit bought nine ABC learning centres with children already enrolled, uh, systems set up, the structure, everything ready to go, one dollar each. They paid nine dollars and they bought nine childcare centres, making money, staff already ready to go. Do you think because they're a not-profit that maybe they didn't have the same pressures that, you know, uh, ABC learning centres did as a publicly listed company? Yeah? Okay. So, um, Basically, we're going to finish up. Um, there's a couple, I could tell you some scary stories about if you don't know what you're doing and you try and just go and buy a business. Because the challenging thing I have, right, in only how long I had, 90 minutes, is that I teach you enough that you're dangerous. Um, and if you go out and you buy a business, and people have, I've, I've run webinars and things, and people have done that, chose not to work with me further. And they're like, oh, I've got a finance degree and I've done courses on acquisitions. And then they've gone out and bought businesses and they've called me up six months later in trouble. Um, I, one lady, she spent $900,000 more than she should have. She paid $1.9 million for a business that was only worth a mil. That sucks. Um, thankfully, even though she kind of signed contracts, we were able to view, do some fancy stuff with lawyers and she got out of the deal. Um, but like, that's the scary thing. So this absolutely works, absolutely. Um, and you guys should start using this 
If not right now, seriously, now is, we didn't touch on it, but one of the best times in history to be buying businesses is right now. Who can tell me why? Market in transition. We've got baby boomers. Huge amount of people who are going, I'm at the end of my life of wanting to do business and I want to start traveling, uh, being a gray nomad, whatever it is. And these people, sadly, a lot of them are just going to shut the doors. How do I know? Because people tell me. They don't know there's any value in their business. They don't know how to sell the business. When I tell them what I do, they're like, oh, I've never thought about that. A lot of them are just going to shut the doors or they're going to sell it for next to nothing and there's a huge opportunity. These guys are just like, look, it's time to move on. A lot of them, because they're still in their businesses now because their super got hit. And they're going, well, I'm here because I need to make money. What if you said, hey, look, vendor finance, I'll buy your business and I'll keep giving you money so you can keep living, but I'll take care of the business stuff. You can just start traveling. So in the next, you know, this is a thing that's going to be happening over the next five to ten years in particular, but get in early before your competitors start doing it. Buy the competitor before they twig to it or come to one of my seminars and learn how to do it and they end up offering to buy your business for a dollar. Okay? Um, I want to give you guys all a gift um, because I've known Steve now for probably two years and um, when he told me about what he was doing down here, I thought that's awesome. I'd love to come speak, but also I want to give you all a gift. So, how many of you like to learn? Awesome, good. How many like to read books? How many don't really have time to read books? <laughs> yeah, so uh, you're going to love what I'm going to give you then. Um, what you need to do to get it, is it all on the right thing? If you go to bba.my slash, oh, that might not work actually. Go, you're going to need to go to Business Builders Academy. I know my tech person set it up, but I don't think the bba.my link forwards properly. So businessbuildersacademy.com.au slash B4B gift. And it's a copy of my book, Red Means Go. It went to number one on iTunes in the business category. Um, I've received emails from people all around the world telling me how it's helped them think bigger, work smarter, and um, change their lives. It's really how I went from being a shy 15-year-old to who I am today, um, even though I read it, wrote it a couple of years ago, so it's maybe a couple of years out of date, but uh, it's a, my gift to you guys. This sells for $17 on the, on the iTunes store and you're going to get the audio absolutely free um, just to say thank you for, for being here. Thank you for showing up and thank you to Steve. So, um, yeah. How good's that? <laughs> all right, guys, so what about we all get up standing actually and thank Carl Taylor not only for a fantastic 90 minutes but also for a very, very generous gift. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. It was sensational. So we might have a quick chat, Carl, if that's cool. Sure. Right. Oh, same sort of thing as after Ivan's presentation. What we want to do is find out what you guys took out of Carl's presentation and what really resonated with you and hit home and what you've learnt from that. So um, thanks, Carl. So just shoot your hand up and just tell us. Share with the rest of the room what you got out of that presentation from Carl Taylor. Yes, Brian. Um, I, I have actually put a fair bit of what you're talking about as from an accounting point of view. I've bought a lot of practices that can just say that it does definitely work. Um, but the things that I've never thought about with the amount of struggling businesses which are not in our industry, accountants generally tend to make money anyway, but there's a lot of other aligned uh, businesses which I hadn't really been thinking about in the past. So that's what I got out of it. And that's brilliant. And Carl, just to let you know, Brian owns an accounting firm up in Sydney and coming down into Wollongong, which is one of the best accounting firms from where he is. So that's a big wrap. Thank you, Brian. Awesome. Thank you. Very good. Okay, what else? Who else learnt something that they want to share with the rest of the room? Yeah, Terry. I, I just, it just sort of opened my eyes to, to not get locked into, you know, have tunnel vision and, and what my business is doing. And I can add another business to it if I need to. Uh, reasonably easy the way you're saying but uh, one of my other questions was is these businesses that you acquire uh, do they just you just fall over them or where do you find them okay so the question <laughs> is where do you find these businesses which is a good question Terry yeah so there's kind of two ways to find businesses for sale there's well there's three types of businesses for sale um, but we generally I teach you to focus on two uh, those are listed businesses so there are lots of business for sale websites there's newspapers um, and you can find businesses that way. However, for a lot of you, your competitors and people in your industry aren't necessarily going to be ready to sell right now. Or they might be, however, they haven't thought about it. 
So it's how do you access those unlisted businesses for sale, the people who aren't selling yet. Um, and I mean, to give you some quick ideas, so businessforsale.com.au is a great site, businessesforsale.com, that's a UK site, but it's got some Australian sites. Seek Commercial, probably one of the worst websites in terms of aesthetics, but being Seek, they do get a lot of listings. Um, so there are a lot of those. And then for getting unlisted businesses, there's kind of a lot of strategy around how you do that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to, <laughs> hard to give you in a quick soundbite. Um, you can think, look at things like LinkedIn, uh, just calling up. Um, but there's, it's really like you, you want to manage the approach right. There's a lot of stuff you want to do before you make the approach and then, you know, building that, kind of having a strategy. Like one of the, I didn't have time to go through it, but one of the big things is, you know, before you buy any business, you've got to have rules. That's the big mistake that people make is they just go out there with no real strategy. The biggest mistakes happen when you don't write your rules. And rules are designed to do two things, protect and focus you. Okay? Um, so, like, I mean, if, if, if it's for anyone who is seriously going, this is something I want to do, come and see me at the back of the room. I've got a masterclass coming up in September um, that you guys can attend. It's a two-day. Or I've got DVDs, and I've got a couple, I brought a couple of things here today if you want um, some DVDs and, and books and stuff. So uh, just come and chat to me. I'm going to be around for a little while. So, um, yeah. Yeah, perfect. All right, maybe two more questions. Guys, shoot up your hands. Yeah. That's a great question. Uh, there's so many. How, how do I list? Um, probably my, like, my biggest failure that I like to tell people about, I suppose, is um, my first business, where I made the typical mistake, 15-year-old, didn't know anything about business. I borrowed money from my grandmother to... Uh, I, I had this brilliant idea, as most startup people do. And he's like, oh, I'm going to sell costumes. Now, this is... Are we going to do it online? Uh, this is early days, pre-Google uh, being what it is. And... Uh, I thought, yep, great, went online, found this place in the States, bought this, these costumes uh, in, borrowed money from my grandmother to pay for them. But being 15, knowing nothing about business, hadn't read a business book or seminar or anything yet, just the idea, who do you think my market was? Who do you think I thought my market was? My friends, school. How many 15-year-olds have a couple hundred bucks or whatever to buy a costume and will need a costume? So I had this great thing, had these things, took them into school, people were like, wow, that's really cool. Who wants to buy it or hire it? Zero. <laughs> um, so that was probably my biggest lesson, biggest failure in terms of, it was a great getting started, but f lesson in learning that, and you may have heard it before, but the idea is most people, they think they've got a great idea, and I see it in startup, tech startup people all the time. They've got a great idea, and they think they're going to revolutionize things. You can do that, but you've got to find the hungry crowd and just give them what they want, as opposed to creating this brand new revolutionary thing, because you haven't proven it, and you're probably very wrong. So, yeah, that was probably my biggest failure. I mean, other than that, I've hired staff and wasted, you know, $6,000 on this one guy, hired him through a recruitment agent, and then two weeks later, he, you know, gave back all his stuff, so, you know, it didn't cost, didn't make me any sales. Recruitment company was like, yeah, I'm going to, we'll get you another person. Did they? No. So that was six grand just down the drain. Uh, selling my business for 600 bucks when it was worth six grand. Like, yeah, I could probably keep... Go on. Yeah, but it, and it's really interesting question, and it sort of fits in with the theme that I wanted to get across to you guys for these two days. And if you look at the cover of your folder, there's a quote there, and I've, I have I have done that on purpose because the the question was, what's your biggest mistake? And it's only a mistake when you stop. That was a mistake. You stop and you have failed. Yeah. And then it's a lesson if you keep going and continue. Yeah, look for feedback, not failure. Yeah, so it, it, and it, there, it's really distinct differences between what is a mistake and what is a lesson. And if you can get that mentally that this is a lesson that I've learned rather than a mistake that I've made, then, then that's where the um, possibilities lie, I would say. And that's the lessons that I have, Carl has, and most of you that have travelled on the business journey will have made or learnt from lessons along the way. And just, yeah, just quickly also yeah. on that, sorry. Um, I think one of the other big lessons that I've learnt in more recent times is as entrepreneurs, it's kind of why I do what I do now, because entrepreneurs, right, we see shiny balls everywhere and chase opportunity after opportunity. And I like to think of life as like a sushi train. And so, you know, opportunities are coming past all the time. You need to reach out and grab it and take it off the plate. But the thing is, in, I don't know if you've ever been to sushi train and got too many things, and in, in that small little space you've got, there's only so much you can kind of hold, right? Business is the same thing. 
Opportunities, sure, if you don't pick it up, it might not come back around. Maybe someone else will pick it up, or it might, or another opportunity is not far behind it. Opportunities of a lifetime, a mentor once said to me, an opportunity of a lifetime or deal of a century will come around every day. So just be focused and know what you need to do. You know, you don't need more shiny balls. Like, even, you're going to hear a lot of strategies from me, from other people this weekend. You need to decide what's right for you and what fits in with your ultimate plan. And don't go, oh, I need to do this and I need to do this. Because I've been to seminars where they say, oh, you need a web, website. No, you need to write a book. No, you need to do this. And then ultimately you sit there and go, well, what do I do? That's why, like, I always make sure I don't bring in lots of speakers, lots of ideas. It's you're coming in the program and it's step by step. This is what you need to do. Do this, then do this, then do this. No lots of ideas you could do. So get, make sure you're clear on what you're trying to achieve and just yeah. stick to it. Very focused. Good friend of ours, Andy Smith, and I call it the entrepreneur's curse that we have. As entrepreneurs and business owners, we are always looking for that bigger, better idea when really we should just stay so focused on what we're doing, make it work, make it profitable, and then maybe perhaps leave ourselves open for new adventures and new ideas. But um, guys, once again, if you wouldn't mind putting your hands together for Carl Taylor, um, a very, very awesome presentation. Thanks, mate. Thank you.